I wonder if you can recognize any of these finger click tactics to encourage giving. Every five seconds, a church roof loses one of its tiles. If you give money to the church roof fund today, God will magically make money fall into your hand. So make sure you don't leave without first putting money into the offering box. Making sure to draw attention to yourself, of course. So no matter if you're rich or poor, here at this church, we expect everyone to dance to the same tune. Make sure that you bring your tithe. That's 10% of your nine to five. We demand this even if you're poor, yet if you're rich, we demand no more. <laughs> now I just want you to think, what might be the motivations of the person who gives in response to these appeals? Maybe guilt. Every, every five seconds a church roof loses one of its tiles. Or perhaps the motivation is pressure to conform, to dance to the same tune as everybody else. At this church we expect all our church members to give to this degree. Perhaps the motivation is selfishness, people wanting to draw attention to themselves. Look at what I do for other people, even though I'm actually doing it for myself. But which of these clicks was the motivation for giving in the early church? Well, I'm going to read Acts chapter 4, verse 32 to 37. <laughs> All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all, that there were no needy persons among them. From time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales, and put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone who had need. Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called, called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, sold a field he owned, and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. <laughs> Here we see God's people giving, not to the church roof fund, but to each other. They loved people, not buildings. And notice in verse 32, how their motivation for this kindness was internal. Verse 32 does not read, and one of them, the preacher, told them that they should all share what they owned. Their actions were not externally motivated by the pressure or guilt put on by somebody else. Instead, we read in verse 32 that each of them, all of them, as individuals, came to this conclusion themselves. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own but they shared everything they had. Why did they do this? Because, verse 32, all the believers were one in heart and mind. Recognising their unity in Christ, seeing each other's other as brothers and sisters, showing love to each other as a result. This surely has to be every church minister's dream, to see God's people in unity and showing practical care and concern. So by verse 33, the question every minister is asking themselves is this, what was the sermon that brought this unity and love about? Whatever it is, I'm going to be preaching that sermon next week. <laughs> well, verse 33, with great power, the apostles continue to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. In one sense, there was nothing, es nothing especially original about the apostles' weekly sermon. Each week they simply pointed people to the Lord Jesus and all that he did for them. And yet these sermons were unique and original. For just think, do the rich ever join the poor for more than just Red Nose Day? And yet the Son of God came to earth 
to join us. Just think, does anyone always put the interests of others above their own? And yet Jesus made our needs the focus of his entire life. Do people have a habit of giving up everything for those in need? Not really. And yet Jesus gave up everything for the least deserving. Does anyone love others more than they love themselves? And yet God's son loved sinners. The apostles pointed people to the Lord Jesus. Somebody who gave up everything for the likes of you and me. And we, when he is the centre focus, two things will click. So firstly, click number one. Well, to explain click number one, uh, I'd like you to, to draw a circle just with your finger. I'd just like you to draw a nice circle in front of you. Hopefully, uh, you've achieved that and proved to me that you can draw a circle. Now, I'd like you to imagine that a sponsor form has been put at the back of church. Let's say it's for New Hope for Children, uh, an orphan, a, chari a, a charity that... Uh, that provides schooling and uh, a home for less fortunate children in Bogota, Colombia. So there's that sponsor form at the back of church. You write down, you write down your name and you're about to pledge your donation when, dun dun dun, you realize that the three people in front of you have all pledged to donate 15 pounds. Now, I'd like you to imagine yourself writing a big zero next to your name, knowing that everybody behind you in the queue is going to read it. Because of all those other clicks that we thought about before, guilt, pressure to conform, the desire to impress, suddenly drawing that circle, a big zero, it's not so easy. And yet, Drawing a big zero is at the very heart of the Christian message. We come to God with a big zero, zilch, nothing to offer, no good reason why God should show us any kindness, for we have rebelled against him. And yet, despite this big zero, we ask God to show us his infinite kindness anyway. In the words of an old hymn, Nothing in my hands I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. Naked come to thee for dress, helpless look to thee for grace. Foul I to the fountain fly, wash me, Saviour, or I die. Coming to God with nothing except faith in Jesus is at the heart of the gospel. And you, when you realise that, something clicks. If you are rich, you are free, absolutely free, to keep what you own. Peter will go on to explain this in chapter 5. You will not go down or up in God's favour based on how much or how little money that leaves your bank account and goes to charitable causes. So there's no need to fear the judgment of others. If you are poor, you can be free from guilt because you can't give. You don't need to feel the pressure to give the same amount or of time or money as somebody else. Every believer can write a big zero on that sponsor form without fear that they've lost God's approval. If you write a, num a number with six zeros behind it, you won't earn more of God's favour either. At the heart of the Christian message is that we all come to God with a big zero and yet leave with his total acceptance and infinite love. And when you realise that, all external pressures come to an end. And yet, during the Apostle Sermon, something else clicked as well. Click number two, verse 33. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all. God's grace was at work in them. God's grace was at work in them in such a way that the moment people saw a need, those who were able 
went on to meet it. One example of this was Barnabas, a Levite, who, who under the old Jewish law was under the least external pressure to give. Basically, the Jewish people were divided into 12 tribes, 11 of which were commanded to give away 10% of their earnings. But the tribe of Levi earned nothing and so were not demanded to give in quite the same way as everybody else. And yet, verse 36, Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles had nicknamed Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, sold a field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. Something clicked in Barnabas that meant he showed practical love without any external pressure. What was this thing that changed? Well, it wasn't more cash. He'd presumably been rich for a long time. It wasn't more time. Looking after fields, I mean, is a full-time job. Nothing had changed in his external circumstances. Instead, something changed in his heart in response to the message of the gospel. How you see the undeserving changes when you believe the gospel. We didn't deserve it before we received God's kindness. This means we can forgive others without them needing to prove they deserve it first. How you respond to need changes when you believe the gospel. Our need was met by Christ despite the cost and despite the sacrifice. This encourages us to move beyond the pain barrier sometimes when we give of our time and resources. How you see other believers changes when you believe the gospel. If you are a believer, God chose to become your father, as well as choosing to be the father of every other believer that you meet. This causes believers to unite despite their differences, even though we might not naturally get along. Your main motivation for giving changes when you believe the gospel, whether it's giving time, giving money, giving forgiveness. In the words of the old hymn, to see the law by Christ fulfilled and hear his pardoning voice changes a slave into a child and duty into choice. That's a hymn by William Cowper or Cooper, I'm not sure how to say it. So that moves us on to the next part in Acts chapter 5, verses 1 to 7, 16. Now a man named Ananias, together with his wife Sapphira, also sold a piece of property. With his wife's full knowledge, he kept back part of the money for himself, but brought the rest and put it at the apostles' feet. Then Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept for yourself some of the money you received for the land? Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? In other words, Ananias could have kept all that money and would have been perfectly okay. What made you think of doing such a thing? You have not lied just to human beings but to God. Basically he'd lied, saying that he'd given all of the money that he'd got from the field, when he actually only gave a part. When Ananias heard this, he fell down and died, and great fear seized all who heard what had happened. Then some young men came forward, wrapped up his body, and carried him out and buried him. About three hours later his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. Peter asked her, tell me, Is this the price you and Ananias got for the land? Yes, she said, that is the price. Peter said to her, How could you conspire to test the spirit of the Lord? Listen, the feet of the men who buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out also. At that moment she fell down at his feet and died. Then the young men came in and, finding her dead, carried her out and buried her beside her husband. Great fear seized the whole church and all who heard about these events. The apostles performed many signs and wonders among the people, and all the believers used to meet together in Solomon's colonnade. No one else dared join them, 
even though they were highly regarded by the people. Nevertheless, more and more men and women believed in the Lord and were added to their number. As a result, people brought the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and mats so that at least Peter's shadow might fall on some of them as he passed by. Crowds gathered also from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing their sick and those tormented by impure spirits, and all of them were healed. I suspect you warmed more to the first passage that we read than the second one. We like the idea of pure love, a, lo a love not contaminated by ulterior motives or motivated by pressure or guilt. But the concept of pure hatred, God's pure hatred of all sin that creates just disunity among his people. Well, that's not something we warm to quite as easily. But just for a moment, let me tell you a story about you sat on a beautiful, warm island, enjoying a refreshing drink of 100% pure orange juice. If you don't like orange juice, make it pure mango juice or 100% oat milk or, or something else. You're probably enjoy, enjoying the way that the story is going. Until I tell you that this orange juice isn't so pure after all. At the orange juice factory, one of the workers needed a wee and couldn't be bothered to go to the loo. So, so instead of doing a whiz in the toilet, he decided he'd do it in the big swimming pool where all the orange juice is mixed. Shocked, the factory owner sent some of the orange juice to the lab to assess the damage. The results, 99% pure orange juice. I needn't remind you of what that other 1% is. Now think, would you thank the manager of that factory? for letting that batch of orange juice into circulation? Would you want him to teach his, manage, his apprentices to do the same? We want the managers of such factories to hate impurity with a passion. And should we not want God, the manager of the church, to do the same? Just think, in the first part of this sermon, we heard a story about pure unity, pure love, these are the types of qualities that God and we want to see circulated far and wide. And yet, by chapter, chapter 5, we see Satan sowing seeds of disunity and deceit. And God says no with a passion. God clamps down on the seeds of disunity speedily and decisively. And God does this in a way that is quite unlike anything we really see of today. If you've been a part of a church for any time, you'll probably have seen seeds of disunity. And yet, I suspect, nobody fell down dead. This is probably because Acts is a record of all that Jesus continued to do and to teach. And though the, Jesus is clearly doing something in this passage, I think his speedy and decisive actions are mainly about teaching. Teaching us his church about his pure hatred of disunity and deceit. Now just think, disunity and deceit begins to form in the early church. Would you really want God to release these into circulation? Would you like it if God taught church leaders to do the same? Maybe you've been a part of a church where seeds of disunity have grown. Perhaps you've seen the damage that can be caused through people spreading rumours and lies. You might look back on these situations painfully. You might be angry that more wasn't done at the time. Why was nothing done at the time? I don't know specifically, but perhaps because instead of acting quickly, the issue was allowed to fester. Instead of doing something decisive, the issue was ignored. It's for reasons like these that we should be glad that God's hatred of, of hatred of disunity and deceit is pure, pure hatred. 
We could all do with it being our attitude too. If you've been a perpetrator of disunity or deceit, God wants you to repent with a passion. As soon as you can, make an apology. Buy a stamp today, write a letter this afternoon. Make sure the person you've hurt knows you're sorry by this time tomorrow morning. Where there is disunity between you and somebody else, don't allow it to fester. Address the issue immediately and work on your attitude towards that person today. And above all, remember why. Remember why God calls us to such a response. I'd like you to note how these verses about God taking away life are sandwiched between two passages about God giving life. In chapter 4, we see the apostles proclaiming the good news about Christ's resurrection, the fact that brings hope to all in the face of death. In chapter 5, in verse 12 onwards, we see the apostles perform life-giving miracles, actions reflect the actions that reflect the hope that Jesus brings. The message about Christ is life-giving, and people are saved or lost eternally based on their response. What can attract people to this message about Christ? Well, the type of unity that we see in chapter 2 and in chapters 4. Here we read in chapter 2 of Acts, All the believers were together and had everything in common. Every day they continued to meet together. They ate together with glad and sincere hearts. They enjoyed the favour of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. What attracts people to the gospel? Unity and love practiced in the church. And what puts people off? Well, hypocrisy. The high type of hypocrisy we see practiced by Ananias and Sapphira. People whose profession of faith wasn't matched by their actions. People whose religion was all verbal whilst their character remained unchanged. Something else that puts people off is lies. Sapphira persisted in a lie, despite Peter leaving, leaving space for her confession. She said she gave all the money to the church because she wanted to make a good impression, even though it wasn't true. If you want to make a good impression on other people, tell the truth. Tell the truth, even if it's about yourself, even if it makes you look bad, and even if it means admitting you've made a mistake. That'll have far more impact on somebody than you lying to them and then being later found out. What else puts people off other than hypocrisy and lies? Well, religious do-gooders. Peter tells Ananias and Sapphira that they had freedom in the gospel to give zero of their money and possessions to the church. Of course, they could freely choose to do this out of a sincere desire to help, but doing this only to give themselves a pat on the back or to impress others. Well, it's not attractive at all. Something else that puts people off the church and the message of Christ? Well, disunity. It broke God's heart to see the perfect unity and love of chapter 4 broken. And it breaks people's hearts when they're caught up in it. Sometimes it puts people off church for life. It's for reasons like these that our attitude towards his disunity and deceit should be one of pure hatred. So think, who makes up the 1% of your church that you struggle to get along with? Make working on that relationship a priority. What percentage of your words are not truthful? Even if it's only 1%, we all have something to work on. What one thing do you do more for show than out of sincerity? Admit, admit this to God and ask for his help to address it. What one act are you unwilling to forgive another Christian for? Now, I appreciate the forgiveness is not straightforward. I certainly can't advise you in a sentence. But at least be willing to work towards that forgiveness. Now I realise that this leaves us on a rather sombre note. Uh, 
But never forget verse 14. Nevertheless, more and more men and women believed in the Lord and were added to their number. Despite all that had gone on before, the work of the Lord continued. People appreciated God's hatred of sin. People saw God lo God's love in the actions of God's people. And more people were saved to eternal life as, as a result. Verse 